Hello, everyone. John Rosengard with Environmental Risk Communications in Oakland, California. Thanks for joining our webinar today on asset retirement obligations and how to get started. The outline for our talk today will be a, a definition review of asset retirement obligations and how to measure them. I'll give a, a brief review about how asset retirement obligations and their associated uh, reserving process is better than uh, standard environmental reserves for uh, discontinued operations liabilities. And then from there, I'll cover how to get started in measuring, managing, recognizing, presenting, and disclosing environmental liabilities like AROs uh, in particular, and cover the, the calculation differences that are in place for public agencies which have a brand new requirement to measure and uh, uh, disclose environmental, uh, I'm sorry, asset retirement obligations. Now, finally, I'll talk a little bit about what disclosure looks like in 2019. A little bit of background on me. I started a company called Environmental Risk Communications in 1994. Uh, I'm the author of a software tool called Defender, which works for just one purpose, which is to forecast environmental liabilities like AROs and remediation issues. I looked at a little over 4,400 sites uh, in the last 25 years. Uh, so my basis of, uh, of experience is, is, again, management consulting and um, uh, software development for looking at those liabilities. And I've also given over 100 speeches and webinars now on related topics such as remediation, liabilities, due diligence, uh, how to calculate a watch list for future reserve increases, and how to do decision analysis and counterparty tracking for multi-party cleanup sites. I'm also the uh, ASTM technical contact for two standard guides that are uh, uh, in place and effective. Uh, E2173 is for disclosure of environmental liabilities. E3123 is for recognition and derecognition of environmental liabilities. My terms run for another uh, two to three years, respectively, on those two standard guides. Uh, these documents, by the way, are roughly 20 to 30 page documents that are uh, dense, single page instructions of best practices and lessons learned about good commercial customary practice for, for carrying out the steps as, as the title implies, uh, how to disclose environmental liabilities and how to recognize and derecognize on your company's books uh, environmental liabilities. I, I trust you'd find them to be unique documents and also highly useful with uh, a lot of great ideas about how to carry out the functions that I think each of you have responsibility for. Uh, with that, let me move on to the content of today's presentation, which is to cover a little bit of where asset retirement obligations came from. I'll also be referring to them as AROs today. Back in 1994, the uh, Edison Electric Institute, which is a trade association of utility companies here in the U.S., uh, asked FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, which is uh, funded by the SEC, or Securities and Exchange Commission here in the U.S., uh, to address a, a pressing need, which is, was about how to account for long-term removal costs of major assets, specifically um, nuclear power plant decommissioning costs. Um, from there, uh, two years later, Exposure Draft 1 was issued for something called Statement 143, which was the first document that codified what an asset retirement obligation is. That document, though, wasn't finalized for another five years. In the meantime, the International Accounting uh, Standards Committee, later Standards Board, issued IAS 37, which took effect uh, a year later, uh, and then FASB concluded its work on, on Statement 143. Both of those standard-setting standard bodies, IASC, later IASB, and FASB, we're trying to get corporations to have a, a, a single set of rules for recognizing uh, asset retirement obligations for the first time. In June 2002, FASB 143 came into effect. It was later renamed or retitled uh, ASC 410-20 in 2009. So that's the formal accounting reference for asset retirement obligations today. Uh, on the governmental accounting side, the Governmental County Standards Board, or GASB, issued Statement 83 back in 2016, and that took effect just a, a little over six months ago in June 2018. Uh, so, again, with these three documents, IAS 37, uh, FASB 143, later ASC 410, and now GASB 83, three major standard-setting uh, uh, bodies have identified what asset retirement obligations are, how to book them, how to uh, disclose them, and then how to, uh, to document how the liabilities are being worked out. 
all of this is just pretty new and I just want to give you a sense of what the language is and why these requirements might be new to you and your organization. Uh, so are asset retirement obligations mandatory? I'll tell you what is mandatory. Identifying an asset retirement obligation is mandatory. Booking it is, is not exactly the same, although it's, it, it is pretty close. Um, identifying what, what uh, an asset retirement is involves getting a list of what assets and real property a company owns, like uh, plants, pipelines, uh, retail operations, office buildings, and so on. Identifying what those assets are and identifying if there is an associated demolition, decontamination, or decommissioning liability associated with taking that building out of service. And if so, that's what an asset retirement obligation is. There's, a, I think, a quick rule of thumb to remember. Uh, either an organization will have to book what it identifies or disclose that it w uh, what it identifies. It, it can't just say, you know, I, I don't have any idea that asset retirement obligations are part of how we've been doing things. Necessarily, I just want to again point out a timeline. 20 years ago, these didn't exist, and now they do exist. So there has to be a decision point in any organization in uh, reviewing the viability of, uh, of uh, recognizing asset retirement obligations in a systematic and consistent fashion if that hasn't started already. AROs are one of the five types of environmental liabilities that are out there. Uh, you may have seen this uh, uh, chart or graphic, graphic in other uh, ERCI webinars. This is from ASTM 3123. And uh, what I just want to point out is these five types of environmental liabilities are listed in the numeric order that they're presented in FASB, Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. Uh, so uh, AROs are referred to as ASC 410-20, and then the other citations from other accounting standards boards that you, uh, you see listed in the upper left corner of the slide. Examples of AROs include power plant decommissioning, UST removals, landfill closures, and demolition. Um, it's a very large, high, high intensity, high cost uh, type of environmental liability to bring a site back to what it was pre-construction. Uh, so I want to give you a couple of examples on the next few slides, but I just want to note that, that uh, AROs, as they're disclosed in companies' 10K reports today, are larger than remediation liabilities as a rule of thumb. Uh, so if your organization has, let's say, X dollars in AROs, it may have 2X to 10X in asset retirement obligations relative to the declining remediation liabilities uh, already booked or and disclosed. From there, let's uh, get into some examples of what asset retirement obligations are. On the left-hand side of the slide is uh, uh, an example of an airport decommissioning where an operating airstrip was converted into a park. This is Meigs Field in downtown Chicago, and the, the water body that you see there is, uh, is Lake Michigan. On the upper right corner is a warehouse dem demolition. This is Pier 48 in downtown Seattle. Uh, and then in the lower right corner is a power plant uh, demolition. This is from uh, this is the Grain A power plant, to be specific, uh, which is an 801-foot uh, power plant stack in Kent in, uh, in the UK. Uh, other examples of uh, asset retirement obligations include things like creosote pilings uh, that have uh, exceeded their service life and are being pulled out of the, uh, the mud or the soil, underground storage tanks or USTs, lead-based paint removal, and asbestos removal. Again, keep in mind that AROs were developed back in 1994 to 2001 for that one big thing, nuclear power plants. Uh, but in, in reality, uh, whether it's a power plant or a bridge or an individual building, asset retirement obligations uh, as an, a set of accounting principles and rules apply to everything. There isn't a dollar cutoff that says an arrow needs to be at least X dollars before it's, uh, it's booked and, uh, and carried out. Uh, here's an example in, in my part of the world in the Bay Area in California. Uh, this is the uh, San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge, which was uh, open for service in 2015 after uh, after uh, several years of, uh, of intensive construction. It was a six billion dollar capital project to replace uh, a portion of the San Francisco Oakland Bay Bridge. And here you see the uh, the left side uh, of the bridge now in service and in place, and the iconic uh, bridge tower that you can see on the Golden State Warriors uniforms. And then if you look to the right, you can see the old bridge uh, that had uh, seen its day. There's an asset retirement obligation for that old bridge from 1936 uh, for $300 million, completely independent of the cost of the capital expenditure of $6.4 billion. Now, if you go back in time, 
uh, into the pre-FASB 143, pre-GASB 83 days, the cost of demolishing the old asset would be folded into the construction cost of the new asset, just in one big construction project, one big bond issuing, one big capital expenditure on the books of a company or an example like that. What would happen from there is there would normally be some time for an accrual of an ARO and then uh, uh, asset uh, number two that was put in its place uh, would be uh, demolished and, and that uh, uh, accrual or, or a depre depletion, a depreciation and amortization would kick in. Uh, might not be accurate and it might not be continuously applied, but an accrual process was in place. Now that we have firmer, more specific rules, What's clear today is, is on the bottom half of the slide, we, uh, we account for the demolition of asset number one as part of the cost basis of asset number one, the old asset. When asset number two comes in, we account for the future demolition starting at that time. And I'll go over the math about how that works shortly, but the idea here is, is that you have an old asset with its old ARO and a new asset with its new ARO, and those are booked uh, separately, and specifically, the new rules mean that you can have, again, at the same location, multiple AROs coming, on, uh, coming online in place. With that in mind, I just want to give you an example of, of what to see when you look at a, uh, an individual facility, uh, about the individual assets that can be concurrently accrued for and be part of the backlog of ultimately an asset retirement obligation. I know this is a, a busy slide for all the things that are there, but if, for example, you have a single industrial facility, as I do in this example, you can have everything from rail spurs and bridges to tenant improvements and RICRA permitted units, the utilities coming in and going out, cranes, warehouses, roadways, stormwater bases and conveyances, and so on. It's a, 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 any improvement that you've, you've got put in place qualifies as the asset that may need an asset retirement obligation to fund its ultimate, ultimate return back to a uh, uh, to a pre-constructed condition. Can you always uh, identify when that will occur? You might not know the tail end, like the exact date when that work will occur, but you do know the starting point, which is, is today, if not earlier, of when to recognize at least the beginning part of the asset retirement obligation, which is the, the present value impact. We have lots of debates about whether an asset will last for two more years or 20 or 200 more years. Uh, but the basic idea is, is you can correct for that, but you can always get started today on looking at your asset retirement obligations. Just by way of comparison, I just wanted to show how one industry, namely the power generation industry that asked for the, the uh, FASB 143 rule about AROs, how they've been faring in booking asset retirement obligations. And here in, in no, <clears throat> excuse me, no particular order, are, are seven of the larger publicly traded utility companies here in the US based on market capitalization or asset size. And I just wanna point out, if you go to the lower left corner of the slide, you see that's back in, in 2000, 2001, companies had no AROs to estimate, to display, disclose in their 10K reports at all. But again, using public domain data, I've just graphed out where the asset retirement obligations have been going since then. And you see some companies like, uh, for example, Dominion and Sempra have had fairly stable asset retirement obligations over the last 20 years. <clears throat> uh, other companies like Exelon and uh, Duke Energy, which have grown quite a bit through acquisitions, uh, have had period, periodically notable step-ups in their asset retirement obligations and now have um, just about $10 billion in AROs each already. And they're not... Uh, uh, they're not done accruing for these liabilities, yet those are still coming in over time. So I just want to point out that for organizations that have, um, you know, by the examples here, 15 to $140 billion in assets, they have uh, three to $10 billion worth of AROs is a very, very significant part of their uh, company's balance sheet and long-term liabilities. By comparison, I just wanted to share with you uh, another uh, Another industry here of the uh, the largest landfill and, and uh, waste collection uh, companies here in the U.S. The two largest publicly traded companies are Waste Management and Republic Services. And I just wanted to graph out the data that's in their uh, 10K reports about their AROs. And here you just see the textbook accrual of the, uh, the unwinding of the discount rate, which I'll get to shortly, and just the gradual growth of the AROs as the work becomes 
less and less in the distant future and more and more in the present. Uh, so uh, I want to note for you, Republic Services and Waste Management both had significant step-ups as the accounting rules were clarified, and then later on as Republic Services completed a significant acquisition of allied waste. Uh, but on the whole, for both companies having roughly $21, $22 billion in assets, it's, they both have a, basically a textbook case of accruing gradually for a long-term liability, which will result in, in sudden spending over time, but they're bringing that sudden spending in the distant future into a gradual cost of doing business today. It would make every accountant proud to see that FASB 143 turned into a rational way of uh, apportioning the cost over the remaining useful life of the assets. Somewhere in scope and, and uh, uh, I guess, order of magnitude, and uh, relative size to the asset base of a company is uh, what's going on with the, uh, the major integrated oil companies. And here I'm comparing uh, the big four, Exxon, Chevron, BP, and Shell. And I just want to again note that um, uh, as the rules kicked in 2001 and 2002, uh, each organization was in roughly the same place of having two to three billion dollars of AROs. And then as each invested and grew through um, acquisitions and, and uh, capital expenditures, uh, each of them had successively grown their uh, asset retirement obligations to the range of 13 to $25 billion just in the space of uh, 12 or 13 years. Something interesting happened, though, in the last two years. The capacity to settle out the asset retirement obligations finally caught up with each of the four companies, so the liabilities, in a sense, sort of plateaued for each of the four all at the same time. And it wasn't a, a matter of, um, of capacity in the abstract, it was the capacity relative to the to the uh, the baked in growth of the asset retirement obligations because of the, the sheer size of the asset bases that were being uh, prepared for for shutdown. So again, uh, I just want to point these out as a, a basis of comparison. If your company has um, an interest in understanding its AROs, some of that understanding may be validated by looking at what peer companies are doing today. With that, let's look at the asset retirement obligations and what they include and don't include. Uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, I'm just noting uh, for you that at currently owned or leased facilities, any improvements from the original pre-constructed condition can qualify as an ARO because that, that asset will someday need to, be, uh, need to be demolished or reconfigured for, uh, for a future use. Therefore, anything on this list really qualifies as an ARO uh, in order to um, uh, to account for that transition from a constructed to a uh, post-constructed, if you will, condition. What are not asset retirement obligations are facilities that have been divested uh, and not leased back. Uh, if there are accidents or spills, or if there are waste disposal practices that are changed, that have changed, or um, if there are uh, third-party landfill sites like uh, Superfund sites, those are again unowned properties, or they're related to improper operations. Those are not asset retirement obligations by definition. If you have regular operations, uh, you're closing your RICRA units and closing your asbestos-containing um, uh, asbestos assets uh, and uh, uh, accounting for permit termination for your NIPTES discharge or RICRA permits, you know, all qualify as asset retirement obligations if they're part of proper, normal, regular operations. If, there, if there's any sense of improper operations like spills, uh, fires, uh, other emergencies, or uh, selling off of a property, then asset retirement obligations don't apply. Instead, they're just uh, uh, quote unquote other environmental obligations or remediation liabilities. With that in mind, I just wanted to give you a couple of examples of what the scope of an asset retirement cost or liability can look like. So here are four, uh, four case studies I'll just try through quickly. First, uh, a buyer acquires a $10 million building knowing that it has asbestos, it's under control, lead-based paint that's under control. Uh, but when the, when the building is demoed at some point in the distant future, uh, those two types of uh, waste handling activities will have to be accounted for. The purchase contract clearly transfers the ARO from the seller to the buyer for a $1 million price discount. So the building is supposed to be uh, a $10 million asset, but there's an, at least an embedded $1 million price discount there. So what should be booked? First of all, it's important to keep the assets and the liabilities separate. Uh, $10 million for the asset, $1 million for the assumed uh, asbestos and lead-based paint liability, and then prospectively, 
some cost, some cost for the ultimate uh, demolition and decommissioning, which may not be taken at day zero, um, but probably would be. Uh, but ultimately, that that uh, end date, whether it's 10 years from now or 100 years from now, uh, should be part of the thinking of, of bringing that asset into the uh, the family of assets in the acquirer's books. Again, keep in mind you're you're separating out the asset from the liability. You're not netting them out and saying we bought this asset for the nine million dollar cash payment. It's correct. You did buy the asset for the nine million dollar cash payment, but you also assumed a million dollar uh, asset retirement obligation. So the proper thing to book is the ten million dollar asset and the one million dollar liability separately. What duty do you have annually? Well, you're going to be reconfirming the timing and the amounts for your asbestos and lead-based paint work. It may vary significantly from the initial estimate of a million dollars. And then the ultimate demolition that we've got a starting value of, of three million dollars for. The ARO tasks ultimately are going to be the demo, the removal of asbestos, and a lead-based paint. That's it. Um, going back to the, uh, the next example uh, on our slide here, say a company leases land for 60 years. So we're going to be a tenant on a piece of property. We've, we're going to put in uh, treatment ponds and a RICRA drum storage unit. Our permit is supposed to go for 20 years. So we, we get started, we, we build in some improvements on the, this rented property. What AROs do we have? Well, the point I want to share with you is you can have multiple concurrent AROs at the same site. So unlike remediation liabilities, which will sort of bundle together um, an issue with the soil, an issue with the groundwater, an issue with adjacent sediments and so on, and put it under one budget or control number, here you can have multiple concurrent uh, uh, asset retirement obligations at the very same location, and that's normal. So the initial liability to book today would be ultimately the, uh, the demolition cost for the Rick Red Drum storage building, and then finally the uh, uh, the pond closure cost, again, assuming proper operation throughout the 20-year-plus the duration of that asset uh, for $5 million. So that would be an arrow to book today with those respective useful lives in mind. What are those going to be? It might be 20 years, it might be 60, it might be some other uh, duration altogether. But ultimately, you're going to be working on the same scope of demolishing the, uh, the storage building, uh, completing the RICRA facility inv investigation, and then your RICRA corrective action for the ponds and any uh, adjacent uh, adjacent assets. Third example, let's say natural gas is discovered on uh, our, our property and that we expect to receive 15% uh, of the uh, the well royalties via a partnership share in the wells and related assets, but we're not spending any cash up front. What does that mean in terms of, of what we have as an asset retirement obligation? On paper, we have 15% of the asset retirement obligation. On paper, unless there's something else that overrides that, that baseline assumption. But you know, where it may often be difficult to say, I don't know what number to book, you can start with an assumption today and then modify that as more information comes in. That's quite ordinary for environmental liabilities. What do we have to update annually? Uh, the decommissioning date for the wells, um, perhaps by the individual well, and then the unit cost to do that work. And then figure out in turn if you're going to be, uh, when the work is due to be done, if you're going to be paying in to a, to a pool for getting that work executed by a general partner, or if you're going to have to be doing some portion of that work yourself. That's the ultimate question at the, uh, the wrap up of the partnership. The fourth example I have is say a company is going to build and own four new warehouses for a brand new product line. We expect to have a normal classic 40 year useful life on the building and then a 15-year useful life on the solar panels that we're putting on each of the four roofs. So we've got two concurrent AROs at each location, and let's say, for example, that's going to be $2 million for the demolition of each warehouse, uh, and then 200 k of demolition uh, for each of the solar panel sets at each of the four locations. What do we have to do annually? Confirm the ARO dates that are 15 and 40 years out, respectively, as well as the amounts, of course. And then our ARO tasks ultimately are going to be doing the solar panel removal, and that may happen two, three, four times over the life of the warehouse, and then ultimately uh, demolish the warehouse if we don't sell it with the embedded ARO contained therein. With that in mind, I just want to point out that uh, it, it's a, a strong point of understanding in the auditing community as well as the uh, ARO management community that an early stage ARO is going to have a highly uncertain estimate and that is the work comes closer and closer to execution. 
uh, costs are going to be uh, significantly narrowing over time. So I just want to point out a couple of waypoints in, in a process. If you're doing due diligence or setting an asset up for commissioning, uh, you can have an estimate that's plus or minus 50% and not surprise anyone with the, uh, the degree of uncertainty in place. However, as a decommissioning date is set further off in the future, maybe it's um, uh, three years to five years before the decommissioning needs to take place, uh, there's an expectation that the, the number should narrow significantly to plus or minus perhaps 20% as a rough rule of thumb. When the decommissioning work starts in the field, there should be a really strong understanding of the, uh, the scrap value of any steel, the scrap value of any uh, uh, concrete and any conveyances that are buried underground, um, and, and the costs in turn should be plus or minus the value of relevant change orders, which is a, as a rule of thumb can be plus or minus 5 to 10 percent. So again, the funnel that you may have seen on other, um, other webinars applies here too, where you've got uh, an understanding that an early stage estimate is going to be less accurate than a late stage um, uh, uh, purchase order or request for proposal where the, the scope items are firmly known. So here's an example of how uh, AROs can be documented over time. Um, I won't cover this in, in strong detail, but Jen, just to give you a sense that a preliminary or screening value can have one set of documentation about what the rough issues are and the rough order magnitude costs are going to be. But then as the decommissioning date gets set, it's a different exercise to confirm uh, what the key components are going to cost and the uncertainty around each of those components. Uh, and then finally, once the design and construction is, is greenlit to proceed, the cost can, can and, and will uh, change one more time based on having a, a firm bid from the, uh, uh, the marketplace or, and having uh, quoted prices from competitive vendors. So again, keep in mind this is a logical sequence from left to right, uh, a progression of time as the work becomes uh, less and less about the distant future and more and more about the, uh, the current or the present. A couple of ideas if you're wondering where to start looking at asset retirement obligations, uh, you can start with, uh, with a work breakdown structure. If you want to see a full detailed work breakdown structure, one was prepared as part of uh, ASTM E2150 uh, for uh, nuclear power plant operators who are looking at developing a, again, a comprehensive estimate basis for, their, for decommissioning their facilities. There is uh, 228 pages of detail like I've got on the right hand side of the screen. And that in turn means that there's a spreadsheet out there uh, with 1,957 individual line items that back up those 200 plus pages of descriptions of individual line items. I don't want to rec recommend starting this unless you do have a nuclear power plant uh, thrust upon you and you need to figure out what the, uh, the ARO is going to look like. Uh, in turn, you may settle on uh, a work breakdown structure that pulls out five to 50 samples from this uh, long list if you ever want to see that spreadsheet, drop me an email. I have a copy in Excel, and uh, I, I will wish you good luck or, uh, or wait for your call about where to take things from there in terms of making your own asset retirement obligation work breakdown structure. A couple of uh, points about the math for calculating an asset retirement obligation. I just wanted to use a slide here to emphasize how simple the math is as described in ASB 143 or ASC 410-20 today. Uh, or GASB uh, 83, which I'll cover in a few slides. Um, AROs have very straightforward math. The steps are just these six steps. Step number one, you have to determine the future value of your ARO, which means you have to have a good idea about what sort of key quantities and unit costs you're working with. Um, and if you need some advice and ideas about that, uh, I'm sure the vending community is, is just as supportive as I am in terms of scoping out what a long-term ARO can look like. The next key step is for the owner of that asset, uh, namely you uh, looking at your AROs, to determine the timing. And it's not going to be correct and it's not going to be final and the only guess at when that settlement work will occur. But there has to be some initial statement of when that liability will come out of service. Now let's say, for example, that will be 2031. The third step is to determine your company's discount rate or what's called a credit-adjusted risk-free rate of return. This may sound obscure, but I trust you I trust you will ask any finance person in your organization who will say off the top of their head, it is exactly this. It's, it's, a, it's a number that's known in the controller, CFO, accounting, finance side of an organization 
quite well because it's driven by a company's cost of capital, uh, which again is something very well known inside the, uh, the finance circles of a company. The fourth point is to use Excel. <laughs> it's just to use Excel the way it's, it's uh, uh, set up. And the formula is equals PV parentheses 4%, your risk adjusted rate of return, risk free rate of return rather, 12 years, zero initial, dollar, uh, initial value, 20 million terminal value, and that will give you a present value of 12.5 million today to start. Uh, from there, you have a, a responsibility to book a $12.5 million increase in your asset for ARO number one. You want to increase the cost basis of that asset, start the depreciation clock, and then book your offsetting $12.5 million liability, and then start your accretion clock. That's it. Those are the, the six steps to setting up an ARO. In turn, you have to have, again, a full list uh, of, of what is uh, an identifiable ARO and figure out which ones to book today versus uh, at some point in the future. But what you're starting is just an automated clock that will go year after year after year in, in little bits and pieces and, and set aside the funding for that long-term uh, backlog of your asset retirement obligations. So here, for example, is how it works. Uh, again, you start with on the asset side, you added a $12.5 million uh, increase in the, in the basis of an asset, and then you added a $12.5 million liability, so there's a net zero impact to your company's balance sheet. And then what happens all happens on what's called the income statement of your corporation as you accrete for the other long term liability, and then you write down that initial $12.5 million uh, step up in your asset basis on the asset side. So again, those two clocks just start and they go, 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 go to the year 2030 unless they're adjusted accordingly. What does that mean? The $20 million cost is spread out over the, uh, the 12 years of remaining useful life of the asset, so there doesn't need to be a $20 million reserve increase at the tail end. Why do you wanna do that? Well, that's just good accounting. Uh, the, uh, the important reason why to do it is something called revenue matching, one of the basic principles of generally accepted accounting principles where uh, companies that, that, uh, in, that, that are publicly traded and disclose their books uh, follow generally accepted accounting principles like everybody else. You want to identify the costs of doing business today with your revenues from doing business today. Revenues minus expenses equals profit. You want to have an accurate profit statement. It doesn't take genius, doesn't take wisdom, doesn't take uh, tremendous skills in business to overstate your profit today only to get slammed with a large reserve charge uh, five to 20 years from now. It takes no genius, no skill to do that. That is not, a, uh, uh, that is not excellence in business. Revenue matching though is excellence. It is best practices. So what are you doing? You're trying to book and accrue your, the closure costs that you can see coming over the assets remaining life. What does your company and, and what do your investors think and feel about that? Well, booking an ARO today means more depreciation now, which is generally good. Gradual accretion now, which is reasonable, as opposed to the alternative of deferring the ARO, which means no depreciation now, which probably means sudden reserves later, which again is not as good because it, it doesn't make any of the participants look like they have a firm hand on how they're running their business. This is why you're seeing companies that have 100 to 200 billion dollars setting up AROs for for five to 25 billion dollars. Is that experience has taught them that a large reserve charge for handling ARO type work is not the only way to do things. Instead, it's it's wiser to absorb the zero, the day zero or day one uh, zero dollar impact on the balance sheet. It's better to absorb that today, and then apportion the cost of doing business over the remaining useful life of that asset, because again, it, it, it doesn't strand that, that ultimate expense uh, for when the asset shuts down and there's no more money coming in from that asset. What you're trying to do in essential terms is prevent stranded costs after that asset leaves service, where it's orphaned from having a, a profit center or a, a division or a business unit that's able to fund the work then. Instead, you're trying to again push that cost to when it's incurred, which is again, by accounting definitions, over that useful life of the asset. Just a graphical comparison of what that looks like. Uh, you can have an ARO where you factor in the present value and accretion. That's the solid green line uh, 
Uh, and then uh, if you look at it another way, maybe from the uh, tax perspective or uh, the book earnings perspective, uh, the very same outcome, it can be a combination of depletion, depreciation rather and accretion. Both will get you to that ultimate valuation of a $20 million um, set aside for, for performing the ARO work. If you just set up reserves, you may you may again avoid the uh, the unpleasantness of, of explaining a reserve for, for five to 10 years, but then you'll start the sequence of adding a little bit for study, adding a little bit for design and scoping, and then adding a lot for conducting the field work. That in turn um, you know, may have seemed more attractive for discontinued operations, for Superfund sites, but for continuing operations today, again, best practice is not to reserve, but instead to, uh, to set up asset retirement obligations. If you're interested in starting a program or just interested in a, a really good eye test, I just wanted to give you a slide that would make you happy today. Here are roughly a dozen points of action about how to set up an ARO program if you want to start somewhere. Like anything, I'll just read you a few points. Where you want to start with is a property census. What individual assets do we have and know about? And then professional judgment time, which ones do we think will need an asset retirement obligation like demolition uh, for a building or um, uh, abandonment in place for a pipeline or, or an, uh, an operating well? You know, what will our actions be? And then does that add up to be a, a number that we want to start to book and track as part of our ongoing uh, asset management strategy? If you're, again, looking for where to start, ask around in your organization for a property, a property census or a property summary. Ask uh, for a permit list of what permitted units you have in place from both existing operations and any newly acquired operations where there are permits in place and focus in on NIPTES and especially on RICRA permitted units. Uh, those, will, um, those will have some long-term costs. Again, probability way greater than 50%, costs way greater than a million dollars. You can see those coming, and that again is a probably a useful place to start. Where you may have some judgment calls are in the smaller dollar items, or at least the, the less certain dollar items, like individual underground storage tank removals, asbestos removal, lead-based paint, TCBs, and, and the list goes on. Uh, those may be part of, of handling a renovation project in an individual building, or maybe part of uh, again, a long-term company-wide strategy of pulling out all of the asbestos or all of the underground storage tanks that exist across your company's uh, your company's asset base. From there, I, I won't read through the individual steps, but just uh, keep in mind it, it may be useful to start a pilot, uh, get some feedback on the pilot results, get endorsement for the rollout from the pilot of looking at the entire company over a, I would recommend a two to five year program, maybe settle on a three year turnaround program, and then just have a basis for looking at every asset uh, at least once a year to adjust for inflation, but it, and, but also every 36 months to look for changes in scope. Uh, you will always have emergencies. You'll always have urgent uh, notifications around uh, exiting a business or selling off uh, an asset or acquiring new assets, but just as a standard level of care, updating the numbers every year and then updating the scope every every three years, uh, I think it's just a reasonable level of care if you want to start from having no asset retirement obligation program in place. So what does the recognition process look like to say, I didn't have uh, AROs 20 years ago, but I think I'm, I should be booking AROs today. Uh, I pulled up a graphic from ASTM 3123. Uh, the ARO recognition tests start with understanding what your accounting framework is. Do you work with IAS 37, GASB 83, ASC 410, Whatever that is, there's just slightly different nuanced rules to follow and just work within your respective accounting framework so your auditors are not surprised by how your calculations were done and documented. Next, figure out if there's, again, assets and service, as we covered on the previous slide, uh, that were built, bought, or otherwise conveyed to you, and that in turn have met other obligating events like being put in service and ultimately needing to come out of service uh, great, that's your, your test about whether or not you have um, an asset to work with. Next, will there be an ARO activity associated with each asset? Here's where you have a big backlog of activity if you haven't had it before. So figuring out number one, does that respective asset have an end of service life activity? Will you have to go through a permit termination process? Will you have to, uh, will it be appropriate to demolish uh, an asset 
and return the site to a pre-construction state uh, promptly or within X number of years. What's your company's expectation about a standard of care? Um, there are other recognition benchmarks stated in uh, ASTM E 3123, so I don't want to steal that content from, from this presentation, uh, but just, uh, again, if you're looking for ideas, there are, again, roughly a dozen obligated events and a dozen recognition benchmarks to, to follow uh, to figure out if you have some idea about where to start today. And then finally, periodically, uh, you'll have to look at what you know about cost and timing. Uh, often the cost will move up in a sort of inflation-driven trajectory and be refined for scope activities as, as, as additional information is learned. Uh, and then timing will, will sort of lurch around quickly, starting at one date, staying that way for five or ten years, and then moving around between quarters um, as the, uh, the, uh, the shutdown date approaches. And again, that's a, again part of the normal process of, uh, of ARO recognition. The environmental liability lifecycle is again part of what you may use to, to calculate and, and present and then ultimately disclose your environmental liabilities. The, uh, the watch list um, process may be useful. There's a separate webinar just for that topic. But what you're again going to go through in initially measuring an environmental liability like AROs is figuring out what to accrue and whether or not uh, uh, you're going to footnote or disclose additional data because of what you've got, uh, what you've got booked and what process you've got in place. From there is the long wait via the accrual process, the long wait until the settlement, uh, which means the work is done or the spending is done or the liability is transferred and negotiated away. And then that leads in turn to extinguishment and derecognition, which may happen all at once through a spinoff or a, a financial transaction or may happen gradually as the work is performed over a series of, uh, of months and quarters. Finally, that'll lead to a, a post-recognition watch list and the cycle may continue for reopeners, uh, reopeners from there. With that, I just wanted to point out a couple of obstacles that I, I see to just continuous and general ARO recognition. Uh, and I'll just start with the key one. If a property isn't owned or leased, um, it's gotta be one or the other. If a property is an owner lease or an operation, it's not an ARO. You can't have an ARO at a facility that's uh, just been sold off and is now being run by somebody else or, uh, or isn't uh, leased today if there isn't an active lease in place um, and is an operation. If there isn't a profit center, there's no useful life yet to measure against, and that's just a, a fact of life. In those situations, you have to set up a reserve and you have to handle uh, – any work that's of a, of a demolition, decontamination, decommissioning nature, handle those as, as other environmental obligations or commitments. If you have a lack of data about key quantities or about your facility closure date, I sympathize, but it's not unusual and it's, it's surmountable. It is, it is a, it's a workable problem. In the short term, the idea that you want to follow is just to state your working assumptions and then label them as working assumptions. Uh, no one who works at an operating plant would like to see, oh, uh, the guys in environmental heard that uh, the plant is going to close in 17 years. I better act accordingly. Uh, if, you, if you start that off as an assumption that the ARO work will begin in 17 years, state why. Just state that it's, it's a, an average or it's a rule of thumb number or it was uh, just the basis of the average of, of 10 to 30 years uh, weighted slightly. Uh, don't uh, again, clarify that uh, you're the, the spokesperson for when assets are going to be shut down. You're simply reacting to other information that was created and maintained by others. You're simply the, uh, the conduit for that, uh, that input. Over the long run, what you want to do is look at a variance analysis, figure out what your data gaps are, whether it's the uh, uh, figuring out what the depreci depreciated useful life of an asset has been so far, or how long an asset's been in service, or what sort of key quantities you're working with, you have a, a very good basis for asking reasonable questions as you're doing uh, routine audits and routine facility inspections. One of the avoidable risks that, that you can work through is to say, we don't have regulatory enforcement that's, that's forcing us to do this work as, as quickly as humanly possible. Where you have situations with no regulatory enforcement, you may have no budget at cost, but that's just in the short term of what goes into your budget and what goes into your workforce planning for the next year or two or three years. That doesn't mean that the market value of today's liability for demolishing, decontamination um, activities is zero. Uh, 
So again, those are two different thought exercises. Zero dollars in the budget doesn't mean that there's zero dollars on the balance sheet for the very same issue. If your company has multiple methods of settlement where you may sell off the asset with the embedded liability, fine, that's great. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the asset value should be should be knocked down because the ARO is going to be settled some other way. Your responsibility is to book both the asset and the liability, even though the settlement will probably result in no work getting done. Still, the, again, the responsibility is to keep the assets separate from the liabilities. If you'd like uh, to talk about that offline, uh, I can show you a couple of case studies where that wasn't done and what the outcomes look like. Uh, but again, feel free to reach out if that would be helpful. Over the long term, if you can have multiple methods of settlement, like um, uh, uh, renovating a facility, demolishing it in part, or transferring the uh, the ARO to a successor owner, again, keep in mind that reweighting of those two, three, four, five options can occur and, and maybe should occur every year to three years. So again, verify that the range of options are still reasonable and appropriate for uh, today's market conditions. Uh, finally, uh, one of the obstacles to ARO recognition can be the use of different discount rates that may have been inherited or be part of doing, op uh, doing work in different parts of the world with different costs of capital in different places. Um, keep in mind these are all fixable, workable issues. They shouldn't uh, prevent, uh, just like the accounting literature says, these obstacles should not prevent the performance of the duties of estimating, presenting, uh, managing the uh, asset retirement obligations over the long term. They're not serious obstacles. For organizations that are uh, uh, public agencies here in the U.S., like state, county, and municipal government agencies, I just want to point out the slight difference in how AROs are calculated. Uh, it's uh, just a, really a four-step process, but it still starts with the same idea of understanding what the, uh, the, the future value is going to be and when it will occur. So again, that's um, uh, our baseline cost of $20 million and our expected performance in 2031, give or take a year. And what you do in terms of a, of a discount rate is instead of the risk-free, the credit-adjusted risk-free rate of return of roughly 4%, we use just a proxy for inflation, which today might be 2 to 3%, and that's it. So we come up with a different starting value. We, we book an offsetting asset as a deferred outflow of resources. We book the liability both of those at the start date when our asset comes into service or is, is recognized for the first time. And then we go forward with the unwinding of the discount rate or the accretion process from there. So again, just very minor differences between uh, ASC 410-20 and GASB 83 about the calculation method. Uh, from there, I just wanna talk a little bit about how to apply uh, event trees uh, to asset retirement obligations. You may have, uh, again, differences in performance expectations today versus how the work would ultimately be done uh, several years down the road. But the idea of, again, any event tree is to make your thinking process visible. And some of the easier aspects to master in doing this are keeping your uncertainties distinct from your decisions and then your negotiated outcomes as well. Uh, so this uh, uh, example here where we're starting off with, with knowing that we're going to manage some subsurface assets like foundations, pipelines, buildings, sewers, stormwater outfalls, and so on, uh, we figure out what's unrepairable or what's deteriorated but still usable and then what's well-maintained. We figure out if, if what's the state of condition for all of those assets and then in turn figure out what our range of costs are going to look like and uh, display the calculations accordingly. Over time, the range of options will narrow. We'll have fewer and fewer options available. So these um, uh, event trees do look really complex for early stage sites and then become gradually more uh, simplified as, as uh, options are excluded due to the passage of time or decisions or just uncertainties working themselves out. With that, let me go to uh, an example here to just give you an idea of another variable to work with. Uh, here is a, a, a portion of the north slope of Alaska called the, uh, the Heel Point Drill Pad, which uh, goes out into the Beaufort Sea, or the, the Arctic Ocean, if you will. Uh, again, on the north, the northernmost, uh, uh, one of the northernmost points of Alaska. Uh, this uh, uh, asset uh, and drill location is uh, owned and operated by a, a partnership of BP, ConocoPhillips, ExxonMobil, and then the heirs of, a, of an Alaskan. Uh, 
those four parties are depending on each other to make sure that when the time comes, and that time may be decades away, but when it's time to take this asset out of the Arctic Ocean and return it to its pre-constructed state to some degree, that there is a, a, there are financially viable partners ready to do that work. I'm not sure the exact corporate structure or the exact uh, uh, ratio of ownership, but again, I just bring up the idea that you can have um, uh, an asset in place today and have a very good understanding of how that work uh, or that asset is managed and how the profits of that asset are distributed. But over the long term, or at least in terms of the termination of the asset, you'll have to figure out if there's some counterparty risk, if every party will be in equal financial condition at the end to be able to pay their relative, uh, their allocated share of the uh, the asset retirement obligation. So again, keep in mind if, if there's an agreement that there's a $4 million ARO divided equally among four parties, if one of those parties goes away, it's like musical chairs. Now you have $4 million divided three ways. Everyone's share just went up by 33%. So the, uh, the idea of, of identifying uh, counterparty default and uh, uh, where that risk is in place is, again, where there are assets with multiple multiple owners of the liability. And you may have contracts in place that say, you know, we bought this asset, but the previous owner said they will help share in the demo cost 50-50, or they will uh, for the, uh, the AROs um, as incurred. And keep in mind, those promises are only as good as the financial viability of the, uh, the or provider of that, uh, of that guarantee. So the takeaways for this, show your work. If you're using the basis today of saying there's a, an allocation among four parties, show your work today. Recognize that any auditor will want to see professional judgment being applied and skilled cost engineering being applied, and that probabilities are part of that professional judgment are used in place. And again, like I noted on the, one of the previous slides, keep your uncertainties distinctly separate from your negotiated outcomes and the decisions that you're going to make. With that in mind, the, the methods for calculating counterparty risk are fairly straightforward. There are actually some common terms uh, in place for the uh, loss given default, as it's called. And uh, uh, we're in a, an environment today where most every enterprise that's uh, environment, economically highly active, shall we say, they have a known credit score that we can use as a basis for predicting the long-term probability of a default against uh, an environmental liability. There's a separate webinar I've got up on our YouTube page that covers just this topic in detail. So with that in mind, I'll move forward. Let's say you're looking for a rough rule of thumb uh, to, to look at your asset retirement obligations in your company, and you're wondering if you've sort of over, overdone the estimates or, or, or cut the, uh, the scope of activities a little bit too far short. I just wanted to give you some research that I conducted over the last uh, few years. I pulled up the, the 10K reports for roughly 20 companies from the time span of 2003 to 2017. And then I put that into a a Monte Carlo model to get a range of outcomes uh, based on the derived data of that sample size of 20 companies. Um, I don't have any specifics to share with you about which 20 companies, but uh, suffice to say, these are probably those that are more likely to have AROs than not. Um, but I, what I wanted to track that's, that's uh, identifiable by the red line in the graphic on the top uh, portion of the slide is the, the, uh, the median ARO balance divided by total assets grew from about 2% back in 2003 to around 3.3% now, which means if your organization has a billion dollars in assets, you can say today, as a rule of thumb, we would probably expect around $33 million in AROs for every billion dollars in assets. And it can vary quite a bit from that. It could be as little as, as a million, I'm sorry, $10 million in AROs per billion in assets to 10 times that, $100 million or more in AROs per billion dollars in assets. There's lots of moving pieces behind that and lots of assumptions, but I just wanted to give you a rule of thumb uh, if you're wondering what to expect in terms of looking at your company's asset base and saying, you know, I, I wonder what this number will turn out to be, what sort of backlog of AROs we can expect that need to be part of us are, are doing business uh, quarter after quarter, year after year now, instead of taking large reserve charges at the end. The rule of thumb, 3% uh, of, of total asset. 
With that, if you're interested in this topic in more detail, I just wanted to share with you what I think are, are the best uh, the best resources to read. Uh, the documents tend to be on the short side. Uh, so again, I encourage you to, to absorb this content in the, the 20 to 50 page gulps that it looks like here. Uh, the FASB.org uh, website provides uh, ASC 410, which is the definitive document about AROs, uh, as does GASB.org for GASB 83. No substitute for taking a look at that, maybe reading it once a year and just reaffirming one's understanding of just what an asset retirement obligation is today. If you're looking for practice guides about how to estimate, display, disclose, present environmental liabilities, I, uh, I'm speaking from firsthand experience of trying to put good commercial customary practice in, in the public domain. I encourage you to take a look at the ASTM standards, which are written for environmental liability holders that are looking to pass audit and build a reasonably uh, competitive program in managing AROs and other environmental liabilities. The four documents you see displayed there are, are ones that I've worked on personally. And if you have any questions about any of those four, particularly the middle two, uh, you're welcome to call anytime the meter is never running. I'd be happy to, to cover them in more detail with you. So just to sum up our uh, presentation here today, I just wanna point out what's at risk for getting started on your asset retirement obligations. Number one, you don't wanna be looking at a set of runaway AROs where the AROs are growing so quickly or are deferred so long that they, they eat the company. They just uh, become a massive part of the balance sheet and can't be, uh, can't be handled from there. You also want to avoid surprise closure costs years after production ends at a facility. This is an avoidable miss uh, where revenues and expenses are not matched up. You want to, of course, prevent misallocation of capital, your people, your money, your reputation, and your scarce attention. You want to, to focus that where it will do the most good and that in turn will be part of recognizing your AROs as they occur instead of at the tail end of a, an asset's useful life and prepare for that work and sequence it out rather than uh, handle the work uh, in a reactive sense. Finally, you want to uh, be ahead of gap compliance and auditability and be prepared for that next year of reviewing your AROs as part of your, your backlog of all environmental liabilities. That combines to, to, to yield you the trust of your stakeholders if you fall down on any one of these, you have some catching up to do. And if you want to, again, improve, AROs have to be a, a core part of making sure that your assets are or aren't triggering individual AROs that'll have to be dealt with in time. The long-term challenges, challenges that you'll have to work with are making sure your ARO forecasts are relevant to your evolving asset base and making sure there, there is an explainable or there isn't a large gap between the book value, what's already on the books, and the market value of your AROs if you had to do all of the work uh, in the current, uh, the current calendar year. Uh, another challenge is uh, settling a book liabilities at an optimal rate, which means these assets did not come in the, the portfolio all at once. The AROs will not all be executed in one fiscal year, so the work has to be spread out. How do you justify the, the stratification, the sequencing of the work? Uh, do you have complex sites first, you have low cost sites first, predictable uncertainties taken care of first. What is your strategy for settling uh, your booked liabilities at the optimal rate? Another challenge is making sure your spending is matched by liability reductions. It takes no skill of any kind to just spend money without measuring whether the liability is going away. But the expectations of your stakeholders are when you spend a dollar, you get a dollar of value, maybe even a little more, but you, get a, you generate a dollar of value for spending a dollar. And finally, if you have partners, are they going to be able to properly share in the full life cycle costs or will they be triggering uh, full, uh, I'm sorry, counterparty risk to you? A couple of questions that have popped up from previous webinars that I'll just handle now. Uh, why should we pursue this now? Why should we look at AROs today? Well, essentially it's, it's part of good compliance with generally accepted accounting principles meaning the revenue matching principle, which is just part of good capital stewardship. There's also a responsibility, and it's just expressed in GASB 83, not in ASC 410 or IAS 37, of something called intergenerational equity, of not leaving surprises for future managers, employees, and investors to deal with, but instead making sure that today's problems are booked and dealt with and recognized uh, more or less today. Uh, another reason to, to look at AROs today Assets are going to keep keep growing. 
None of them or very few of them are going to last into perpetuity. Therefore, you can expect a growing body of arrows, whether they're booked or not, and ultimately it will be someone, it'll fall on someone to, uh, to recognize and then settle those liabilities. And arrows in turn are probably your enterprise's largest single class or subtype of environmental liabilities. So a couple of ideas about how to start. Look at your 10K report, find a property census, plan on a pilot effort, uh, roll that out. Uh, if you get endorsement, roll that out over several years, and then finally figure out ways to optimize and convert that to an evergreen effort. With that, I'm going to end our webinar uh, recording here today for just, if you just hang on for a moment.